Maguire. Once again, I am under the weather. I went to the doctor and he said, you know, I never got sick until he had kids, and then he got sick all the time, and then the kids left and he stopped getting sick. So I got a while in front of me uh, until I stopped getting sick, but I, uh, once again, yesterday I had no voice today, and it's back a little bit. So if I pop a cough drop in, that's why. Hopefully we'll make it through the sermon this morning. It is good to be with you. As last week we started a series on what it looks like for us to live out this collective faith together. How do we, as the body of Christ, live it out, devote it to one another, live it out with each of us, uh, doing our part, as we talked about last week, in a series that we've entitled, that we're better together, that that's what God has designed his church to be, and deeper than that, that's what he's designed us to be as people. We are communal beings. We need each other. We need one another. And we need to be in relationship with one another. And that is becoming an increasingly countercultural way of life in the world in which we live, an individualistic and narcissistic world. We've been given this calling and this gift of community. Last week we talked about how we are the body of Christ and that just like the body has many members, so do we as the church, but each of those members does their part to make one body, that we have a responsibility to each other to do our part. And so what is the part that you're doing? And, and we turn our attention today to a passage that if you've been in this church at all over the last 10 years, if you've joined this church or just been coming to church here, you've heard me talk about what it looks like to be an Acts 2 kind of church. And once again, we're going to turn our attention to that. How do we live that responsibility to one another out? How do we live out this faith together? And how does that make an impact in the world? The second part of our sermon series, Better Together, challenges us to be devoted to one another. And in that devotion, to have the four pillars of the church in which we stand. We open our Bibles this morning to the book of Acts chapter 2 reading verses 42 through 47. Here now the reading of God's holy word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in each other's homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray this morning that we would learn what it means to be devoted to one another and to the cause of the kingdom. Let your word rests on our hearts. And may the words that I speak and the meditations of my heart be the words that you speak. Pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This past week, which also might be the reason why I'm sick and have no voice, is that myself and Dave Friend and Mike Bart had the opportunity to gather with our national denomination in our annual meeting in Dallas, Texas. Before you get jealous, the high while we were there was 44. It was cloudy, and we did not see the sun until we got on the plane. So uh, as we were getting in our Uber to go back to the airport, the uh, Uber driver told us that it's usually 70 and sunny while we're here. And we thought, well, not while we're here, because of course, when we try to escape the cloudiness and cold, it came with us, apparently. But that's not why we were there. We were there to worship with our brothers and sisters from all over the country, 1,700 people, over 1,700 people. We got to listen to what's going on with the church in Egypt, which is growing and expanding rapidly, the church in Iran, which we've talked about being one of the fastest growing uh, church movements in the world today. We got to hear from people in the United States who are on the front lines doing gospel-centered work, and it was an amazing week of, of worship and of prayer. A 
week of fellowship, which is probably why I am without a voice, because I got to catch up with all of my dear friends, uh, including Jed and my Addicts, who were there with us for the week. And, and so uh, it, it, was, it was so fascinating to me, knowing this week that I'm preaching on Acts 2, to be part of a denomination that's just eight years old, which in terms of, of denominational standards, that is, is like, uh, you know, my newborn babies, right, my young babies. And, it was just so refreshing and encouraging to be part of a group of people who are committed to Acts 2 because we, we seriously spend the entire week in fellowship, breaking bread and sitting at the tables together in prayer and devoted to the apostles' teaching and the teachings of the Word of God. And it was so refreshing. We don't talk about our denomination very often, but it was so refreshing to have a leadership devoted to those things. Which made me wonder, what does that look like in our church as an eco-congregation, a covenanted order of evangelical Presbyterians? What does it look like for us to live that out day in and day out? To understand Acts 2, we're going to get back to the beginning of what's happening in this book and in this chapter. You have these disciples who uh, have been, we, we are up in the upper room and they're just waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And that upper room is such an important part of the story. Because the upper room is the place where Jesus was with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, gathered around the table. The upper room is the place that the disciples went after Jesus was arrested and taken to be crucified. They hid in that room with the doors locked. And that's where Jesus appeared to them in the Gospel of John, showed himself to them in the locked upper room. And once again, they find themselves in the upper room after Jesus ascends to heaven, and Jesus tells them, go back there and pray and wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that's what they did, and the Holy Spirit came. And all of a sudden, these disciples who were living in fear have this power within them to go out and proclaim boldly and audaciously that Jesus is alive. So that's Acts chapter 2. That's where, that's where we end up. The Peter and the disciples have gone out into the streets and they're preaching to the masses that this one that you know, this prophet that you heard about that was crucified by Rome, I'm telling you that he's alive and I've seen it with my own two eyes. And you need to believe in him. He is the Son of God. And you need to believe. Now, we have all heard the story of Jesus' resurrection, right? We know it. And if you're here today, it's probably because you believe it. And there is a, a group of people, uh, even if they don't believe it, most people in our world or our culture today have heard the story, even if they don't think it's true. So it's not shocking for us to hear that Jesus has risen. But imagine you're a first century Jew standing on the streets when Peter begins to preach about how Jesus has been resurrected. That is, uh, let's just say, a little crazy town, right? I mean, you've got to think, if you're a first century Jew, you've never heard the story of resurrection before. You're not quite sure what this guy's talking about. Oh, and by the way, all of the disciples are speaking in different languages. And so... The people on the street actually say, and it's in the text, don't listen to that guy, he's drunk. Sounds about right, right? If somebody came walking in to your house or to your street one day and just started screaming about somebody they met who had resurrected from the dead, what would your reaction be? Call the cops, because we've got a crazy person on our street, right? But Peter, all of a sudden, could care less what anybody else thinks of him. Because he has up until this point. Now, all he cares about is sharing the good news that Jesus has risen. All he can do is tell the story. Which is so incredibly fascinating. The shift that happens, that Peter, all he wants to do is share the good news. But see, that's what in 
an experience with the risen Jesus does for us. An experience with the risen Lord, an experience with the risen Jesus, it changes us. And if we believe that Jesus is Lord of our lives, and if we believe that this really is good news for us that draws us into eternity with Jesus, well, friends, that is something worth sharing, isn't it? But part of the problem, though, when we think about this in our culture and world is this, this term or this phrase evangelical, right? Because that phrase, that term, scares some people. <laughs> The other day, last week, not even a joke, uh, I was home alone with the kids. I had just gotten them down for a nap, and two women knocked on my door to read scripture to me. And I was like, can't you see I'm the pastor of that church over there? Right? Like, I live in the parking lot. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear who lives in that house. And they wanted to, that's what we think of when we, I slam the door in their faces. I, I, I didn't say I said, I'm a pastor, thanks, I work right over there, my kids are napping, because the dog's going crazy, and if she, they woke up, man, I was going to track them down and kill them. <laughs> I know you love Jesus, but in Jesus' name, get off my property. So, uh, you know, but that's what we think of, right? When we think of evangelical, we think of these like crazy fundamentalists, we, we think of uh, the, unfortunately, this has happened in our political discourse, that evangelicals just sort of been lumped into the religious right, and, and we, we, what we think of is sort of fundamentalism and craziness, and, and people that have gone sort of way off the reservation. But that's not what evangelical means. And quite frankly, we, we've lost the art of being evangelical because we've lost the definition of it. The word evangelical stems from the Greek word eugelion, which simply is defined as the good news. That's it. The good news. And if Jesus is Lord of our lives, and Jesus has conquered death, and risen from the grave, and draws us into eternal life with him. Now, isn't that something worth sharing? According to Pew Research, did you know the average Presbyterian shares their faith once every 10 years? Once every 10 years on average which means some of you are doing it once every 20 years. Why are we so slow to share that which is good? One of our keynote speakers was a man by the name of Eugene Chow. He's a church planner. And he works with a consulting organization in Seattle, Washington. And he's, when he moved to Seattle and the neighborhood that he was in, there was this, this gym. He's telling us a story. There was this gym that was one block over from his house. So uh, they were running a, a special, sign up for free, $9.95 a month for life. So good deal, right? So Eugene goes and he signs up. And then a month later, LA Fitness bought the gym. And if you know LA Fitness, like there, there's nothing cheap about LA Fitness. And so, but according to Washington state laws, he was grandfathered in. They weren't allowed to change his contract. So now he has a lifetime membership at LA Fitness for $9.95 a month. Can't beat that, right? And then he said, do you know how many times I've been to the gym in the last 10 years? Once. To give them my credit card. He hasn't been there. And he says every once in a while he drives past the gym and he thinks, yeah, I'm going to start going there. I got this membership. I'm going to utilize it. But he never does. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you of workout equipment in your home that operates as a drying rack, right? <laughs> that, we know who has it because you're laughing. Because marketers in the U.S. realize we don't have to sell you on working out. 
we only have to sell you on the idea of working out. We only have to sell you on the idea that it's something you want to do. It's a multi-billion dollar business in the United States. See, the truth is we love the idea that people will be drawn into Christ. We love the idea that we're going to be people who share our faith. But who cares about the idea if we don't put it into practice? See, the American church, we've been sold on the idea, yes, the church, we want people to know Jesus. We want people to have a relationship with him. Yes, we want to share our faith. Just come to our church and figure it out. That's what we do. But we haven't shared the real story about how this person named Jesus came into our lives and changed us and made us whole. Because that's the story that people want to hear. Only 10% of conversions globally happen through crusade-like things like the Billy Graham crusade. 90% is about people to people. Peter, all of a sudden, has this audacious claim that Jesus is alive. And Acts tells us that that day, 3,000 people came to faith on the streets of Jerusalem. 3,000 people. But they didn't need those people to go and figure things out on their own. Right? We're like, okay, check, check off, you're here, we're glad. Time to integrate into the church. Let me show you how we do things around here so you can figure it out. Or we'll just keep showing it up. You'll, you'll figure it out along the way. You see, we, we want an evangelism. We want people to, to come to church. We want people to grow in their faith. But we actually just want them to do what we do and like it. Right? 3,000 people were added to their number that day, and Acts tells us, and then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. See, this encounter with Jesus changed them. And it wasn't just about changing jerseys, right? They didn't just move their loyalty from one side to the other. It, it wasn't just about, well, I guess now I'll just be over here and I'll, I'll be with this team. Like, it's, it's not like jumping from the Browns to the Steelers, which would make sense, like, right? Because they, they've got it figured out and, and the Browns don't, right? So it would make sense that you made that. That's what it is. But it's not just about switching their loyalty. They actually become these people devoted, devoted to these four things. I would call these four things the pillars of the church. It is how they build the early church. And I think they have a lot to teach us about how we continue to build in the church today. But it requires devotion. You see, devotion is something much stronger, much bigger than loyalty. We can be loyal to things, but you can move that around. Devotion requires action. It's not, it's not just the idea. Loyalty is an idea. But devotion requires action. I'm loyal to my sports teams for God knows why. Right? But I'm devoted to my family. Now some people around here have that. Maybe a little bit backwards, but we can talk about that. I'm loyal to... My Southwest credit card, right? I have, a, I have a loyalty to that. I'm in their loyalty program, but I could easily jump ship. It's not going to take much for you to convince me to do this. But I'm devoted to the church, and to Christ and His work. Devotion requires action. Devotion requires love. And love requires sacrifice. Sacrifice is in action, right? And so we have to ask this question as the church, what is it that we're devoted to? That's not hard to find out, by the way. 
Where is it that we put our time, energy, and resources? And I'll tell you what we're devoted to. But what we should be devoted to are these four pillars. The first is the teaching of the apostles. So let's break this down a little bit. What are, what are the teachings of the apostles? Well, who wrote the New Testament? All the letters, all the gospels, right? Those are the apostles. And who taught them? But Jesus. It is the devotion to the word of God. Now, we can be defenders of the word, which we have been. We, we can be believers of the word, which many of you say that you are. I, I've heard you say that. We can be defenders and believers, and we should. But there's a different approach when we say we're devoted to the word. Because that means we allow the word of God to shape and form us. We allow the word of God to tell us who we are. You see, friends, if we're going to be a church that says we believe the Bible, then we need to be a biblical church. And what that looks like is a church devoted to the word. That we dwell in it. That we grow in it. That we don't just say we believe it, but we actually read it and participate in it. And it shapes and forms us for God's redemptive work in the world. Devoted to the apostles' teachings devoted to the Word of God, which informs all that we do as the body of Christ. The second thing is to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. I know this is crazy to think about, but we live in a world and a culture that says, I can do faith on my own. That is personal. But as the church, we are to be devoted to fellowship, which means community, because fellowship simply is a shared and common pursuit of something greater, a goal. Fellowship happens with people who are present with one another. And it's one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Because we become slaves to our schedules and slaves to these stupid boxes that we carry around in our pockets all the time. That we can be with somebody and not be present. Fellowship requires presence. And it's a place that we as the church could make a huge impact on the world around us by authoring, offering authentic community and fellowship, a place where you're known and loved, despite whatever it is you may bring to the table. Fellowship requires more than one. And fellowship is the place where relationships are built. But in order to do that, we have to be present with the people we are with. Notice that the text says they didn't devote themselves to worship, which is generally how we would view that. Worship is what flows out of the hearts of those who fellowship together. The third thing is that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now this would indicate to us a communion, but communion simply means common union, a shared belief system. But it's deeper than that because we, we read later in the text that they met together in each other's homes and brought bread together. See, it's around the table. It's around the table that we're shaped and formed. When I was a kid, my mom used to mandate that we had dinner together every night, which sometimes meant we, we ate at like 8.30 at night. And I hated that. And now I look back on it and think, praise Jesus for a mother who was committed to being around the table together. Because friends, it's around the table and the breaking of bread that relationships are built and formed. It's around the table that we're shaped and formed as people. Broke bread to 
together. That seems to be slipping away from us as a culture because we're just so busy. Friends, the impetus for our faith and fellowship program is Acts 2. And we commit to studying the word together. We commit to fellowship together. We commit to the table to break bread together. You should come. It starts March 3rd. Shameless plug. That's what it's about. To be devoted to one another is to stand on these things as a church. It's not just about gathering for worship. It's about being the body devoted to one another living this life out together. The final thing is prayer. To be a church who cares about our community, who cares about the unreached, who cares about the lost, is to be a church who's committed to praying for one another and for the world around us. Because prayer attunes our hearts to God and to one another. Who do you pray for, right? Pray for the people you care the most about. Friends, this has been a point of failure for our church. It may sound harsh, but it is a reality. Our session identified this last month as a place where we have drastically fallen short as a church. And we have. It's not to be mean, not to make you feel bad, but we have fallen short of being a church who prays. And I'll be the first one to take responsibility for that. But if we want to be an Acts 2 church, and we want to be built on the pillars of the faith, on the pillars of the church, the thing that Jesus built his early church on, then we have to be a church who gathers together to pray. Hopefully in the next month or two we're going to have an answer for you on that, but you can start doing that on your own. We're praying for the lost. We're praying for our neighbors. We're praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're praying for our church. See, these are the four pillars of the foundation on which Jesus builds the early church through the work of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 came to faith, and then they devoted themselves to these things. And Acts tells us, and they met together every day in each other's homes, breaking bread together. They met in the temple courts. They shared with everyone who had need. They gave everything they had to the poor. You see, out of, out of this, these pillars, these things that they rested their lives on, flew, the, the generosity just flowed from their hearts. Graciousness and mercy just flowed from their being as the church. And Acts tells us, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And they did it without a mission statement or a budget or a building or a program. did it by devoting themselves to the word, to fellowship, to the table, to prayer. As we seek to be the church that Jesus has called us to be, as we seek to live out this faith that people might come to know this Jesus, that we share it together, as we seek to live better together. May we as the church devote ourselves to these four pillars. To the word, to the fellowship, to the table, and to prayer. May we be devoted to one another in these things. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us now stand and affirm what we believe by stating the Apostles' Creed.